Hi, Caroline. Welcome to the show. Hi, Wayne. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, uh, lovely to have you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, you're a you're a former academic, is that right? You you used to work at a university as a prof. Is that true? I like to go with the term recovering academic. Re recovering. <laughs> I've seen that applied to alcoholic and Catholic <laughs> recovering. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a similar vibe, I think. <laughs> it's a part of who I am. It is something that uh, I will never, ever quite leave behind, but it is a, a path from which I have veered. <laughs> you know, you, you can't touch it even a little bit because you'll just go right back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's always the fear. So we pull back in. No, it's not that bad. But you seem, we, uh, although being a prof is a cool job, and you seem to have moved on to even a cooler job, which if this still applies, and if I've got this right, you're a resident historian on board cruise ships. Yeah, it's a uh, rough life. <laughs> uh, I thought, uh, that's the, uh, I'm going to say it's the second best career in the world, and I'm not going to tell you what the first best one is. But could, could we could we start by talking about what, uh, if you don't mind, like why you left academia and and how you landed the the cruise ship gig, and also if you can throw in there, you were uh, you're an historian. Like, what was your area of research and study? Sure, um, it it all connects. Well, actually, my research and study doesn't quite connect, but um, I taught for years. I, I was a high school teacher and then a university professor and was just looking as unfortunately so many professors are for something a little bit more stable. Um, uh, it's at least in the States um, and, and perhaps in Canada and, and increasingly in Europe, being a professor is an increasingly unstable position to hold, particularly in the humanities. Um, and so I was looking into ways that I could stay engaged with students, stay engaged with topics that I love, um, but create more of a stable life for myself and my husband. Um, because one of the other things about being in academics is it can be somewhat um, overly mobile from city to city and, and right. all over the place. And so coming to the conclusion that we wanted to stay in our, our chosen hometown of Chicago, I was looking at options and completely coincidentally at that time um uh, cruise line viking cruise lines uh was expanding their offerings into their quote unquote large ocean ships which aren't actually that big and they were looking for historians to come on board and i had free time on my hands having decided that i was going to take essentially a a personal year off from teaching to decide what I wanted to do. And they had the opportunity to jump on a ship and go sail around the Mediterranean in that time. And I thought, well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and over the last five years, I go on board whenever I can for them and travel. And basically it is the best kind of classroom. I am teaching history, talking history where it happens. I'm mostly in Europe because that's where my research is based. Um, I did a lot of work on 19th and 20th century Ireland, um, and my undergraduate work was actually on uh, Roman archaeology and classical history and classical languages. So I kind of had that modern and ancient yeah, strength nice. in Europe, and I think that has served me well um, on the cruises. And it has just been wonderful. I'm actually headed off uh, a week from yesterday. Uh, in, in six days, I'm headed back over for a month. So it will be a lovely way to spend my October and November. Um, and it it's just a, a wonderful opportunity. And most of my colleagues on board are actually retired professors. And I've, I like the idea that I'm doing now what everyone else waits to do until they retire. Good. It's a, I, when I read it, I sort of had to say, is this a thing? And if it is a thing, what a great thing it is. And, and just let me just let me clarify, uh, what I gathered is that, uh, yes, you're his, an historian on board, but you're also helping people who are writing books. You're coaching them as well, or is that a separate thing that you do on land, so to speak? That is a separate thing I do on land, but it comes out actually out of my time on board. I was uh, finding, I had had the opportunity, excuse me, the unusual uh, uh, circumstance in which someone came up on a cruise and they came up to me after a talk on goodness knows ancient Rome or something like that. And they said, here's my book manuscript. Can you read it and tell me what you think? And I, I said, no, that's the craziest idea. Why would you want me to read your book? 
And a conversation ensued in which they said, well, no, we've, you know, talked to you over the last week or so. And, and we, yeah, are, I really like your perspective on the past and I'm working on this novel. And, and I admittedly, I passed. I said, I just don't think I'm qualified for this. Mm. And then it happened again. And it happened a few times on board in which people would come up and say, I'm working on a book. I want to talk to you about it. I'm working on a book. Can you read a chapter? And I thought this is maybe something I should do. I, I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> it's a skill set that I have for my academic work, but the idea that I could help people write their books without having to write my own, which is great, <laughs> um, is is something that that really started calling to me without me asking for it. And then a very close friend reached out on land, as you said, um, <laughs> out of the blue a few years back and called me and said, I'm working on a book no one knows. I thought, who can help me with it? It's got to be you. And and that for me was the turning point. It was, this is now someone who knows me. It's not just a random person I met for two weeks on a ship. And from there, I started expanding. And basically now my, my full-time job is working with writers who are trying to either start writing a book or who have finished a book and now don't know what to do to make it a great book and publish it. Right. And, and are the books, do the, uh, you mentioned the, the first one, there was a novel. Are the books all over the place, fiction, nonfiction, all sorts of topics? They have been in the past. I started out as I think so many people do when they start their own business. I was like, I can do anything. What do you need? And over time, I've, I've had the fortune to be into kind of narrow down for, for myself and, and for my writers. I work mostly in memoir and nonfiction and a little bit of a little bit of fiction here and there, but not quite as much anymore. Um, in the end, there's I my in my circle of editing and coaching colleagues, there are so many people who are so committed to the kind of niches of fiction that I think you're much better off working with someone who specializes in romance or speculative fiction. Um, even though I mean I can sit, I can help. We, we can work together, but I can probably give you somebody better for that. Um, mm. But if you're working on nonfiction um, or you're trying to turn a real life story into fiction, let's talk. It's that's exciting. Yeah, no, it's actually probably a very good decision. I'm no no doubt. I, I, I'm an editor as well. Uh, right. I, would, I wouldn't call myself a book coach, although I've done, I guess, what you call developmental editing, where you sort of have that macro look and you, you know, advise on more than just commas and style. And uh, like, for example, in fiction, I will I, I will edit like literary fiction, but uh, like fantasy fiction and stuff like that, just because I don't really read it very much. I don't feel I'm it's sort of like what you said, qualified. But with literary fiction, I feel I'm quite qualified to advise on that. So that's a that's a nice uh, niche, as we say here in Canada, that you've developed here, uh, there, and um, uh, yeah, that's that's really good. I and I can see why you would make the choice to say, in a sense, you're sticking with nonfiction, but because uh, fiction is a very very different beast for sure. Yeah, definitely. And and like you said, I mean, there's folks like yourselves who are like, oh, bring me literary fiction. There's there's certainly plenty of specialists in all of those different spaces that it's good yeah. to be able to say, oh, hey, I know this person. And and that in and of itself is is a good service that I think I can provide. And I'm, I'm sure you know that same feeling of, you know, not only do you have your strengths, but there is strength in being able to say, and here's where I would recommend the best thing for you. Yeah. And, and also, of course, at least in my case, uh, and maybe yours as well, you know what your weaknesses are as well, right? Or your uh, places where you're less strong, let's say, and mm -hmm. you can maybe, maybe you'll develop a little circle and you can say, well, I can't do your speculative, speculative fiction novel, but I know this great editor who, and there you go, right? So exactly. Yeah, right. And um, I, I know what a book coach is, but uh, some some of the listeners probably might not know what a book coach is and does. Maybe you could just say a little bit what that is. Sure. So a book coach, uh, the way I like to think about it, there's two ways. If you come at it from an editing perspective, um, basically, I I think of it as a developmental editor who's thinking very long term about the project. Um, with no due dis no disrespect to developmental editors, normally you go to a developmental editor for that that big picture view. Here's what you can do to work on your manuscript. For me, if you come to me with a manuscript, I'm going to look at that big picture view and say, all right, let's set the plan 
and let's work together to accomplish these clear goals on that plan. Um, because of that perspective, I also work with a lot of new writers or writers on a new book who say, all right, I have this idea. Basically, they can describe the manuscript. Here's mm -hmm. the book I want to write. How do I get it started? What do I need to focus on? And so we'll take, with writers like that, I'll take about six weeks and we will just really block out everything. What, what is the thing that drives you to write? What drives your protagonist? What is the general outline of this book? What's the cause and effect trajectory? All of these kind of key pieces so that as a writer, you can feel that you get to that starting line and you can write confidently. And, and in many cases, after those six weeks of road mapping out everything, I will keep writing or keep writing, keep working with writers to basically act as that coach, that motivational person who is there rooting for you as you're like, oh my God, this book is, is happening. I'm writing. It's some days it's great. Some days it's a struggle. What do I do? And I'm there for that. Um, and so I think the easiest comparison is if you want to run a marathon, you hire a coach, a trainer who helps you prepare for that marathon. They're not going to run it for you. They're not they might be there on on this at the starting line with you or the finish line with you because maybe you're running in your home city. Right. Um, but what they're going to do is every week they're going to give you a set of exercises. They're going to ask how you're doing. They're going to motivate you and keep you accountable, and help you become all over a better runner, a better athlete. And that's what I do as a coach. I I will give you the strategies and the challenges and the tasks and the exercises, and be there and cheer you on as you develop and you write and you revise and you bring that book to life and hopefully then either self-publish as some clients do or start shopping it around, find that publisher, find that agent. Right, right. And just to continue with your, your metaphor there, you make a nice distinction, uh, I mean, uh, a good distinction between a developmental editor and a coach because they're not really, they they Venn diagram over themselves a little bit, but they're not the same thing. Right. So just to continue with your image there of the marathon, uh, the coach is someone who does what you just said. Uh, you know, uh, someone says, I want to run a marathon and that you say, well, you know, you need to this number of carbohydrates and, uh, uh, maybe lose 10 pounds. Then you work on, you know, uh, how much you have to build your kilometers and stuff like that. A developmental editor is more as someone who you've already run a marathon and perhaps they've driven in a vehicle next to you or something like that. And then after the fact, they say, well, you know what, for your, what you need to do is I saw that at kilometer 10, you were doing this and that sort of thing. So it's a kind of an after the fact thing. This image is not quite working perfectly, but maybe you, maybe you get my point. But no. uh, it, it's it's a very different, uh, it's a very different, it's a very, they're related, but not exactly the same. I actually, I, I really like that that way to distinguish between developmental editing and and coaching in that the developmental editor yeah, at the end of the marathon is gonna give you those tips, give you the notes. All right, here's what I saw. Here's what you can improve. Here's what you should focus on. I'm going to make you do jumping jacks. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. Oh, that's right. Exactly. I find that helps with writing in general anyway. It's true. It's better than whiskey because whiskey is not going, not going to help you at all. So no. I'm curious about um, also, um, you said that I, I, you, uh, I forget the two things that you said, memoir and something else that you call nonfiction, nonfiction, right? Memoir and nonfiction generally in nonfiction or, or in, in each of them or in both of them, what are the things that, and maybe this is a, a dumb question, or maybe it's a kind of an unanswerable question, but what are the things that come up all the time? Like, what are the, uh, say, say in the case where someone comes to you and says, just has the idea, as you say, or uh, let's say you sometimes have someone who has something written and, but they, you know, they've got all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, strings that have not been developed and they don't know where to take the story here. And they know that chapter six needs work and that sort of thing. What are the, the kinds of things that, uh, not, I don't mean the, the top ones, but even just a selected bunch of things that come up kind of fairly regularly. I would say across both memoir and nonfiction that, and memoir and nonfiction related, but you know, I, I would argue memoir has a decent amount of fiction in it, even though memoirists struggle with that concept. That's right. Um, 
I would say the two things that come up most with both have to do with, um, there are, in my opinion, there's three major people involved in every book. There's you, the writer, there's your protagonist or your central character, your, what the person, the figure that drives your story, and there's the reader. In both memoir and nonfiction, it's those other two that are the big problem. Who is this book about or what? And who is the reader? And almost every writer I've worked with has had a challenge in one or both of those categories. Um, and with memoir, it's really interesting because people are very upfront about, oh no, the book's about me. And the conversation I have with every memoir writer is no, it's not. It's about some version of you that is now a character in a book that is that knows different things than you know. If, if you wanna write a, a memoir about yourself, if you wanna write a book about some moment in your life, your protagonist is you at that moment. And you in that moment knew different things, thought about the world in different ways, right. related, I mean, listened to music in different ways, did or did not listen to politics or culture or arts or whatever it is, it was all different. And so that distinction is so essential to figure out you, the writer, and you, the person on the page, are actually not the same. And it's a hard thing to happen. In nonfiction, I think a similar problem occurs because a lot of writers that I've worked with are not writing biographies. Um, and an example I would give is that I had a writer who came to me and, and she said, this is, she had this general topic and she kept coming back to one historical figure. And she said, it's gotta be about him. It's gotta be about him. I have all these stories. And we talked and we talked and it, it was so clear that the, one of the, the hurdles she had in trying to get this book moving was that because she thought the protagonist had to be this guy, she was missing the fact that the book was actually about a city. Mm. It was not about him. He was one of many people in the city at this moment in time. And once we figure that out, all of a sudden the book opens up. And so in both nonfiction and memoir, it's that figuring out who is really at the heart of the story and understanding who they are and what they need is a really key challenge that seems like, oh, I know who my book's about. In the end, it's it's deeper than, than a lot of writers think. As And as far as the other who, the reader, everyone wants their book to be read by everyone. And in the end, you shouldn't write a book that you think everyone will want to read because it won't be very interesting. Although it'd be nice to sell 8 billion copies though. <laughs> it would, but, but here's the example I always give, Harry Potter, right? So J.K. Rowling does not sit down in her coffee shop in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and say, Edinburgh, she does not sit down and go, I am about to write a seven book masterpiece that will be read by people of all ages all over the world. She doesn't. She sits down and she writes a book for middle school boys. Hmm. Very niche, very specific, English audience, middle school age boys because she is able to really write to them. Well, middle school girls are gonna re relate to that book. And because it's that experience at that moment in time, kids at that general age outside of England can relate to that book, even though maybe they don't know anything about the English boarding school system. And now you've got boys and girls of middle school age. Now their siblings are reading it. Now mm -hmm. their parents are reading it. And everybody can recognize that authentic piece in there because she had a very narrow, very, specific target audience. So that's how that reader's thing works. You've got to figure out who the best person for your book is. And if you write it well for them, the authenticity and the honesty that you've committed to that niche audience will actually help you to expand that audience. And that's my firm belief. And I, I really think that, that that is a big difference maker. If you commit, and I know there's writers who have like pictures of like, an imaginary reader that they stick to their computer, they stick to their wall, like, this is Joan, I've named her and she mm. will be my reader. And she's, you know, 45 and works three jobs, whatever it is. If you can write to Joan, many more people other than Joan will like your book because they'll realize you're telling a true story for a true person. A couple of points I would say about that. Uh, you mentioned a good word there, authenticity. And that's exactly right. I, I would agree with you. I mean, um, uh, you know, you, uh, that uh, 
the in order for it to resonate with Joan, even it has to be r- real and it has to be um, sincere, if, if for want of a better word. Where and it's sort of like uh, how, how one operates. If you forget books for a minute in real life, if you if you live your life trying to please everyone, for example, uh, that is not only not being an authentic person. But you're going to end up being a person with kind of low integrity and a, a person that everyone thinks is a kind of a, a blank in a way. But if you if you are authentically yourself and uh, please some people and don't please others, uh, that's a better person to be. And ergo, over to the book as well, the same thing. If you write authentically for Joan, uh, Joan is connected to other people, sort of that Harry Potter thing you were talking about where... You know, it expands out and out and out. So, uh, and yes, yes, you'll never get to the 8 billion likely, but you'll, you know, you'll get to more than just Joan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. it's all about being your authentic self as a writer and and showing up on the page with the best version of the story you have to tell. And if you always worry, and I think it maybe adds, lends itself to, or it fosters imposter syndrome too. If you're always worrying that there's a reader out there that you haven't done something for, then it's actually going to shortchange your story and it's going to really make you a slightly paranoid writer. Oh, but what about this person? What about this person? What about this person? And you feel like you have to add in all of these parts of your book for all of these imaginary potential other people. No, just focus on one, write for them. It's so funny because again, at least for me, what you say applies to just living your life as a person as well, right? It's the same sort of thing. If you imagine that because I commit this action, uh, you know, my mother is going to be upset with me or uh, my my professor kind of thing. Right. Uh, you can't, if you do that, you you diminish yourself, right? And and you would diminish the book as well, uh, just to sort of flip it back kind of thing. Uh, right. I'm cur- curious, one more question just about the memoir part, if I want, if, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I get what you're saying about, uh, you know, that's not what the book is about, you said, and eventually you might either convince or show or lead or guide or inspire or whatever someone to see, yes, it's about that city or it's about this or whatever. Um, Do you ever have a, or do you often have a problem with people being uh, reticent or reluctant about things? So a memoir does have at some base level, some kind of uh self-revelation or some sort of um talking about yourself or some sort of biographical element about it even though it's a sort of a slice of life it's not a you know beginning from birth sort of thing generally speaking uh do you ever have people who although they know they have to say this they're a little reluctant to say say uh, uh, episode x which happened kind of thing always Uh, okay thank you very much (laughs) (laughs) it is a caveat i i give to every memoir writer i work with there will come a point in your story in which there is something that you don't want to tell Mm. and it doesn't matter how open you think you are how much you think you've dealt with these things in your past how it could be a joyful memory i mean that's the thing everybody's like i don't have the dark trauma well it might be a joyful memory maybe there's something you're going to i guarantee if you are writing memoir you will hit a moment in which a story will come to you or it will feel natural to tell and you will self-regulate that story. And unfortunately, it is always clear on the page when it happens. Always. Yeah. Because that's... all of a sudden the story goes from like, and here's this, this thing that other people can relate to and it's heartfelt. Oh, and then it was lovely on Tuesday. <laughs> and then this next, and, and it, 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 you can feel it. That there was something that the author, again, authenticity, something that the writer hit a point and held back. And so, yeah, 100% of memoir writers that I have worked with, and I would be willing to bet 100% of memoir writers have had a story that they have had to decide, do I tell it or not? Wow, I'm glad to see my question was as dumb as I thought it was. That, that's not that's, dumb at that, all. It was right on point. I'm glad that, you asked. That's fascinating. I really find that fascinating. It's sort of like if someone were telling about their week and they were saying about great things on Monday and Tuesday, and then they said, uh, "Oh yeah, on Wednesday we got up and then went to bed late, and then Thursday we uh, <laughs> yeah. what happened on Wednesday exactly?" 
memoir is like social media. You want to show the best version of your story, right? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) But don't argue with so many people. Exactly. (laughs) Do you think that anyone is capable of writing a book or a memoir? Or so let's say a memoir. You mean like anyone can write things? Yes. And uh, like, uh, and do you sometimes end up with, say, clients who say sign on with you to start and for whatever reason, uh, let's say some hesitation in them or whatever it might be, the imposter syndrome, that sort of thing, uh, they just give it up and say, I really appreciate appreciate your help, but I can't do this. Sure. Um, so I so to your first question, I don't see why anyone can't sit down. First of all, memoir, you are entitled to your own story and you should write it. Um, I coach nonfiction and memoir, um, nonfiction obviously, or I think more obviously because of my work as a historian, art historian. I work with memoir writers because in my own academic work, I relied really heavily on personal accounts and memoirs and autobiographies. And I really come to it as a coach that I think more people should be telling their own stories because A, I enjoy reading memoir, but B, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, I would love another historian like myself to be able to find yeah. your story, Wayne, of like what it was like to live in 2022 instead of just reading the headlines from the local press. Like I love the idea of the more people who can make their story something that exists in the world. It, it's a great thing. So I think anybody can and should. Nonfiction is a little bit harder. You have to be willing to do the research. Um, as far as people deciding to write a book and then getting into it and, and then backing out, I would say it's no different than anybody who wants to run a marathon and gets to a point and goes, you know what? I think a 10 K is fine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, there are some writers and there's uh, as many reasons to stop writing as there are to start reading, start, stop writing as there are to start writing. (laughs) Um, I have had some writers who have started and said, you know what, I'm just not at a point in my life when I want to tackle this right now. I'll come back to it. And that is, my job is not to make you run the marathon. My job is not to force you to write the book. My job is there to listen to what you need to accomplish your goals. That's what a coach does. And so I will support you and I will help you strategize and move forward through challenges. But if you get to a point in which you as a writer say, it's not for me. I'm, this no longer brings me joy in my life. And it sounds kitschy, but it's true. This no longer is something that brings me joy. I hate sitting down to write. I don't think I am up for this project right now. Then I'm also there to coach you and say, good, set it aside. Do the thing that brings you joy. And if you come back, if this story stays with you and haunts you, you're going to get back to it. And if it doesn't, okay, you're, you're doing other great things in your life. Um, and so, I mean, I've had writers who have backed away simply because they didn't have time because they decided to focus on other projects. I have one writer that she and I have been going back and forth for a year because she has two different books and one is fiction and one is a memoir. And every time she's like, all right, I'm back to the memoir. She reaches out and then she goes, ah, no, I don't really want to write the memoir. And she goes back to fiction and she's working with someone else on that. So it's, it really is. I'm there to coach you when you are excited to be doing the thing. Yeah, no, that's good. I just had two sort of final questions. Uh, One is for, anyway, I'll just say the two of them. One of them was what what really reminded me about a lot of when you were talking was about a kind of an analogy uh, between, um, and I don't want to make too much of this, but um, uh, teasing out what a good mem- what what a good memoir would be for cert- for a certain person remind me of therapy in a certain way where there's a sto- there's something there's something that the client or the patient doesn't know that the therapist or the book coach can help them bring out and then they will realize oh yeah that is the central thing uh, it remind really remind I, I've been through therapy and that that's why it reminded me of that. It really did some of the things you were saying. And the other thing I wanted to say is that it, it's more logistical sort of thing. Um, so when you're uh, you, you sign on with a client, the client signs on with you and you're ultimately finished with them at some point. Um, 
is it true that part of your work is not the stylistic part or the copy editing part? You don't you don't do that sort of thing. Is that right? That, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that funny? Um, I actually was just having a conversation with fellow editors this morning about um, how editors have things that bring them joy. And um, one of the <laughs> reasons when I started getting into editing, one of the, my hesitations was that I thought to be an editor, part of my job would require me to have handy at all times my Chicago manual of style <laughs> as I checked everybody's bibliographies. And that <laughs> is the worst thing I could ever imagine doing. It's not to say that I don't, I think I have my Chicago manual of style behind me, but um, that does not bring me joy at all. And it almost kept me out of pursuing coaching and editing. Right. Because I thought I had to do that. And to discover that, oh no, there's people who love that stuff. That's what line editors are for. That's what proofreader, like there are people that love that as much as I love coaching writers. Yeah. And so that is definitely a, 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 there are people who specialize in that and they, you should work with them on that. Um, it's not to say that I'm not, you know, generally commenting on grammar or giving tips and that kind of structural support as, as writers work with me. Um, but when it comes to, all right, you've got your book, you've got your draft, you're feeling good about it. You maybe want a professional, if you're, especially if you're doing any sort of indie publishing um, or hybrid publishing, you want to find a good copy. Oh, you want okay. to find a good proofreader to make sure that those, literally those T's are crossed and those I's are dotted. And I am not a person who has, at, at that point, the other thing is at that point, I'm also a lot more like the writer in that. I've seen that story. I've seen these words so often that by the time you get to the end of a project, I'm no different than the writer in that I see what I think is on the page too. You know, right? you can't yeah. edit your own work. As a coach, I can't edit work at the end of that process either because I, I don't see it either. Um, Even if you loved the line editing, you still wouldn't be very good at it, so to speak, because right. uh, you wouldn't be able to see it. That's right. And you're, you're quite right. There's different, you know, different flavors of ice cream for various editors and uh, some like what you're doing and and some like uh, and and both of these are necessary, by the way, a yes. lot, especially for a lot of people who uh, there's lots of people who have. I was glad to hear that you have uh, you even work with people who say who don't have anything written kind of thing and you work at a whole that's that's super awesome because uh that you know you'll just people will end up with a memoir that they would never they would just sort of sat on their couch saying god i wish i could write this kind of thing or i can't get this off my mind so that's really good and it's really good that they get passed along and and you're quite right with indie publishing you'd really they would really need to to do that yeah the one thing yeah. i do want to say i don't want to let it go you brought up the issue of therapy one thing that is important for me as a coach is that I am not a therapist. Right. And I, I think that's a really important distinction that any coach should make when I work particularly with memoir writers, but even sometimes with nonfiction, um, we are going to get into things that are deeper. Um, and there are going to be stories that perhaps I'm the first person who you've told that story to, or that you've shared that thing with, or that you are talking through and grappling, right? You're talking about is this really about, you know, my dog that died when I was five? I don't know. I'm making something up. Um, you may be talking through that to write it, but it's also the process that you're talking through maybe for the first time in the same way that you might in therapy. And I am very cautious and, and I, I try it and I, I hope and I'm confident my fellow coaches do the same thing. If things get to a point where it feels like there needs to be a deeper conversation, I am going to be the person who then says, hey, you need to unpack this. Are you talking to someone, right? Do you have a resource for this? Because I am not certified, qualified, or trained in therapy. I am certified and I have the bona fides to really support your story and to support you as a person as you write this story. But if we're drifting into something that you really need to spend time with this, I'm going to encourage you to go find that person who is certified and qualified to help you in the support of that so that when we talk and we write about it, you can do a better job, right? I mean, <laughs> it's no different keeping with that marathon thing. You come to me and I have you doing burpees and jumping jacks to get your time up. And then you, you know, pull your Achilles. You do not want me 
diagnosing <laughs> your medical problem. Right. I'm going to send you to an orthopedic person. So that's, it is a very careful and important line. And I do, I did, I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to make that distinction that a coach should not be drifting into any sort of like serious therapy stuff. It will come up. There will be honest and heartfelt conversations. There have been tears, but it is not my job to be there as a therapist. It is my job to help you get to your story. That's a good way to end. Uh, uh, it, it, it really, um, I appreciate, I like the fact that you're, that, that shows a lot of empathy and it shows a lot of uh, keen observation and it shows a lot of profession, professionalism, if I may say as well. Uh, thanks very much for this. This has been actually super informative. Uh, I learned a few things about book coaching that I thought I knew before. So uh, thanks a lot and uh, continued success, uh, both on land and on sea. <laughs> thanks, Wayne. It's been great talking with you.